doctors and surgeons of Reddit, what was your this just got even worse moment with your patient, s? Was a resident in Eku and we had a patient recovering from Steven Johnston syndrome, rare drug reaction where skin blisters and dies. He almost so had a clotted femoral pseudoaneurysm, basically a bulge in the femoral artery that's at risk of bursting and bleeding. Between afternoon and evening rounds this patient's nurse asked me to assess the patient's leg because it seemed to be swelling. His whole body was swollen because of all the inflammation he had and fluids he'd been getting for his blood pressure but his right leg did look more swollen than a few hours ago and the skin breakdown was worse. But his aneurysm was stable on the ultrasound earlier in the day so it didn't seem like there was much to do other than keep it well dressed and monitor. A couple hours later me, my co-resident, and our fellow were doing our evening rounds as the general surgery team is assessing a patient a few doors down. The leg looks even worse than earlier. Another few cm swollen and more skin breakdown. All his vitals are okay. He's on appropriate therapy. The three of us plus his nurse and trying to decide what to do when right in front of us his leg splits open and blood comes pouring out. For an instant I think maybe this is just some subcutaneous hematoma that's burst. But then I see more blood rapidly bubbling out of his leg. The nurse and my co-resident throw on gloves and apply pressure while the fellow grabs a surgical kit and tries to find the source of the bleed. I rip down the hull and grab the surgeons who are still evaluating their patient and within two minutes there's a small team of surgeons gowned in gloves searching through this man's leg looking for the bleeding vessel. Another minute or two later and they've found the vessel, a vein and stopped the bleeding as best as they can. I think on the repeat blood work that evening he'd lost maybe 10 to 20% of his blood in that 5 minute period. The problem was the infection now. He was pretty sick and frail to start with and had already had a near fatal reaction to one class of antibiotics. But now when his leg burst open and starting bleeding out there was no time to go off and grab sterile gloves. We just had to throw on the gloves we had and apply pressure. His wound became purulent and he developed bacteria in the blood. With all the other medical problems he was having it was just too much and he ended up going palliative. One of the worst things I've ever seen in healthcare. Young woman in her 20s comes in with an infected heart from injecting drugs. Her infection and heart failure are pretty much past the point of recovery. Her only option was basically four antibiotics. Hope they work, and if they don't go to hospice, the antibiotics get the infection somewhat under control. But the heart slash valve damage is too much. Her heart starts throwing little micro clots. Her fingertips got purplish and she eventually throws clots to her lungs and starts struggling to breathe. She comes to Mayaku, charge nurse at the time. For BiPAP, she decides to make herself a DNR and proceed with hospice. But in my state, DNRs and living wills don't mean crap once you become unresponsive and your family member takes proxy. Her mom, who she was not on good terms with, went to court to receive health care proxy rights once she became too disoriented to maintain capacity for medical decision making. Mom rescinded her DNR. We intubate her. She spends weeks slash months on the ventilator throwing clots despite heparin. Her arms and legs become purple, black, green necrotic. Her abdomen even started to break down and come necrotic. She threw clots to her brain and became totally unresponsive no longer requiring sedation. We took the case to risk management. We held ethics meetings. We went to court against the mother to revoke her health care proxy to fight for the patient's right to die with dignity. The court refused. Mom remained proxy. The patient eventually coded. I initiated CPR and ran her code with a physician. Performing CPR with so much necrosis was beyond disturbing. She did not survive. As residents, we were caring for a toddler admitted to the HEM, in court with a newly diagnosed tumor. Near Oblastoma. Her mom just delivered a baby at the adult hospital across the street three days ago, and because she's nursing, baby sister is allowed to stay in big sister's hospital room with mom. Nurse is called in the middle of the night because baby sister doesn't look right. They're right, she is blue. 
poorly responsive and breathing hard. Looks terrible. We take baby sis right to the earth downstairs where she is properly intubated and resuscitated and diagnosed with the cyanotic heart lesion and is in the cath lab within an hour for a temporizing procedure and undergoes successful open heart surgery the following day. Probably a miracle that she was in a tertiary children's hospital when she deteriorated. I'm not sure she would have survived if she had presented to their local ruler, two, three hours away. Not a doc, but as an EMT trainee, I did my first ride along on an ambulance and we went to check out a guy who fell at a skate park. When we got there he was conscious, could walk, and talking coherently. He'd fallen and hit his head. No helmet, but we did a full inspection anyway, careful avoiding the obvious bruise forming above his eye. Not much blood, pupils were normal, didn't seem bad, probably concussion and a black eye. Well he could have turned us down, but we talked him into coming with us to the urge just to double check everything. So we get him in the ambulance, lay him down, and it was my job to check his blood pressure. It had gone down significantly since first check. Well, it didn't take long and he seemed to be losing consciousness, getting sleepy, and then dot 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 he starts throwing up blood. That would be the things just got even worse moment. We turned on the sirens at that point. The paramedics started fluids. Blood pressure kept dropping. It was no bueno. He was unconscious by the time we got to the air. It sounded like he just barely got there in time. Head wounds bleed a lot as we found out, and not always obviously. That part we skipped, touching the bruise above his eye because it was obviously going to hurt him. Well we shouldn't have skipped it. If we had, it would have felt super mushy, because all that bone around his eye and cheek was crushed, and all the blood, well it was draining down his throat and into his stomach. He ended up having emergency brain surgery, where on top of all the other stuff, they found and removed a tumor. Pretty crazy for a first ride along. Hope he's doing well now, and wearing a helmet. Had a young, mid-30s, patient with metastatic cancer. Cancer that spread to other sites in the body, including both proximal femurs, hip bones, and the pelvis. Cancer progressed and spread despite various chemo regimens and a clinical trial. We, orthopedic surgery got consulted to assess if it was safe for him to walk, do physical therapy in the hospital with the bone lesions, and possibly put metal rods into his femurs to strengthen them and allow him to walk. Two days later he had a massive stroke involving 60 to 70 percent of the left side of his brain. In a matter of hours, this poor guy went from having terminal metastatic cancer to also being paralyzed on the right side of his body and being unable to speak, aphasia. Late and not a doctor but, I'm a paramedic and we were responding to a suspected drunk driving accident. The police arrested the driver. We were checking on the passenger in the back of the sedan that barely had a scratch on it. A fender bender at most. Dude is super out of it with a tiny cut on the back of his head. He is resistant to everything getting out of the car, getting on the stretcher, assessing him, taking vitals etc. He just closes his eyes and pushes us away. We tried asking him what happened to his head and we refused to answer. There's no way that cut happened from the tiny fender bender, it just didn't make sense. Anyways, we take him to the hospital, just another belligerent and drunk, right? So a few hours later, we check back in with the doctor to see what his blood alcohol content was. She says it was 0%. We say that can't be right. Everyone in the car was drunk, the driver and front passenger. Turns out our patient actually had a basilar skull fracture and bilateral subdural hematomas and absolutely no idea how it happened. It taught me to assume there's a medical, traumatic cause to the patient's condition before assuming substances caused it. Err doc here. Patient arrived with complaints of vaginal spotting. History revealed she had been bleeding for two days, not very heavy just a little pain. Stated it started after her female partner had been a little rough during their last sexual experience. Physical exam revealed a complete tear through the posterior vaginal wall into the rectum consistent with what we would usually see during a difficult childbirth. The situation was a bit fishy given the amount of trauma and the backstory so I ordered the usual tests. Blood count, coagulation panel, chemistries. In accordance with our protocol, she was definitely going to surgery. 
tacked on a urine pregnancy test, even though she denied the possibility of pregnancy given her sexual preferences. The pregnancy test came back positive. Needless to say this opened a huge can of worms. Turns out, she had delivered a child two days ago in secret but didn't tell anyone. Had been hiding the child from her family, girlfriend, child protective services, the police, EMS, pediatrics, on. Again all got involved in the matter of minutes after that revelation. They found the child in her apartment under some towels alone in her home. It was a doozy of a night. To those who are wondering, yes, she was a larger woman whose pregnancy was hidden by her size. This happened five years ago and I have seen the child since. Doing well with her grandparents who have full guardianship. And are near, this happens right at hand over as I'm coming on. Patient had dysphagia from multiple intubations, inability to swallow well, weakness in the swallow muscles. Nosebleed starts, he had nosebleeds before that weren't too serious. It's still going, we are giving afferent, vasoconstrictor in the nose to tighten the blood vessels, and holding mad pressure. ENT is like OMW and rushed over, ENT looking inside the throat. There is a clot in there. I watch as the clot falls down this man's throat. O2 sat 98%, greater than 60%, HR 140 greater than 50. I immediately know this guy is about to code. Get the cart. No pulse. 9 up it pushes and like 11 or 12 round CPR we are going to call time of death but the man had a faint pulse after that last round. During the code anesthesia intubates the patient and pulls out a bratwurst sized cloth out of the trachea. Damn he bled way brisker than we could see. He still died that night due to shock, low BP, despite three pressors, blood pressure raising medications, being maxed. Honestly it was a miracle he survived the initial illness that brought him into the hospital but I still cried when I got home because it was a particularly difficult death for me to process. Not a doctor, but the cause of some doctor's oh shit moment. So, quick backstory. I came out of a tree the hard way when a half-grown cat I was trying to rescue took a swipe at my eyes and I jerked backwards, landed on the concrete patio about 12 feet below, which had a little curb that was like 2 inches wide an inch and half high. Oh, and the cat jumped down and landed on my chest. Naturally, I had a big bruise right across my lower back just below the belt line. It was a Friday. My dad said to wait before going to A and E. Englisher, they're swamped at weekends. Figured, he's a doctor, so he knew better. Turns out. No he didn't. So there I was sitting on the bed after being x-rayed, and a very pale looking doc comes in and the very first thing he says is, don't move, stay perfectly still. I'd cracked the three lowest lumbar vertebrae, according to the surgeon. I was probably the luckiest guy that day, they'd split and broken in such a way they jammed against each other and totally missed all the nerves, well, almost, I've a dead patch on my right thigh I can't feel a thing with it a bit of a limp when I'm tired, I ended up in a body cast for a few weeks after they fused the broken bits, never had a problem since aside from the back being stiff enough I can't bend at the waist too well. I worked as a medic back in the day, specifically a mountain medic at a ski resort. Most of the time, like 90% of the time, it was people who feel on the mountain. About the most exciting thing was a broken femur, in which case they were getting their pants cut off. On a rare occasion you would have other medical events, but most people on skis are fit and healthy adjacent. Most of the non-accident stuff happened at the lodge, and since the fire station was literally across the parking lot, they would just call them first. Their jump bags were better equipped for medical rather than trauma. They got called in a heart attack and weren't in the station because they were transporting to the hospital. A lady in her 40s had slipped and fell on some ice. She appeared fine, but we needed to medically clear her, so they called us down mountain from our clinic at the upper lodge. I have no idea why I grabbed it. But I threw our cardiac bag in the leader and we ran down on the snowmobile. I didn't think I would need it and because typically we have to transport someone in the leader we don't pack it unless the call seems we might need it. So I get to her and start asking questions, palpating for broken bones or dislocated joints. Quick neuro and she seems fine. 
but there is just the slightest weakness in her left arm. I probably would have thought nothing of it because everything else was fine. But then I asked her history and current symptoms and my partner just flashed me BP. It was odd. But then she mentioned she was taking Tums. I asked why. She had woken up that morning with really bad heartburn. So I insisted she come with me to a private clinic room we have. It's really just a cramp closer with the few chairs and a desk. She refuses, but I insist. I tell her I want to put a four leading on. She's insistent that I don't, but I finally convince her that I'm not the doc. So I'm probably just being paranoid, but I really just want to be careful. So we pop her shirt open and quickly get the leads on. And yep, she's having a heart attack and it's pretty bad. I have no clue how she's standing, but women tend to have less of the big girly symptoms and are tough as nails. So we get in a helicopter and down to the cardiac center. The air medic always passed me back status on my bigger patients. I like to know when I saved a life. She survived, but if she had waited to it was bad enough for her, she would have died before she would have gotten to a hospital. So... A minor slip and fall of a healthy young woman saved her life. So many. The 80-year-old who came in with the self-inflicted shotgun wound to the chest. As we are fighting to get him stabilized and the surgeons are working to plug all the holes, none of us can figure out why the guy keeps oozing blood. Then we find out that he had intentionally overdosed on blood thinners before shooting himself. We kept him alive long enough to let the family come into the or and say goodbye. The 45-year-old who came in via private car, family drove him in, rather than an ambulance, after what was described as a head injury. We realized how bad it was when someone noticed a plastic grocery bag lying on the patient's belly. It contained the brains that the family managed to scoop up in the hopes that we could re-implant them. The 30-something math addict who also had a permanent catheter infusing life-saving medication directly into his chest for pulmonary hypertension. He came into the ICU with pH crisis, and then we found out why. He had been injecting meth into the catheter, creating a hole through which his life-saving medication leaked out. Medicine is a lot of things. Sometimes it's just tragic. Homeless man is brought into the ed by EMS for a foot wound that is giving him trouble. We eyeball his foot that's poking out from the blanket as he's rolling by and it's a little roughed up, but doesn't seem too bad. We go in to get his story and he says he hurt his foot a few days ago and that it just hurts to walk on. We ask if we can take a peek, so he whips off the blanket to show us his other foot, the one that is actual hurt releasing a horrific stench cloud in the process. We knew we were in for a treat. Guy has his foot bandaged in a very dirty ace wrap. Toes are completely black and necrotic, and there's a maggot butt wiggling near the edge of the ace wrap. We tried to remove the wrap, but it was stuck together with blood, dirt and who knows what else. So time to cut that sucker off. As we cut more maggot began to present themselves and the smell of dead flesh just kept getting more and more intense. We finally make it through and go to pull away the wrap and I swear at least a hundred maggot fell out of that thing. But that wasn't the worst part. The entire bottom of the man's foot was stuck to the wrap and just fell away from the underlying muscle and bone. We told the man we were unfortunately not going to be able to save the foot, to which he responded oh man, really, I didn't think it was that bad. We told the man we were unfortunately not going to be able to save the foot, to which he responded oh man, really, I didn't think it was that bad. I had a patient with a similar sensibility. Story isn't quite as graphic, but it's just as bewildering. Patient came in with an badly infected foot abscess, entire foot was showing signs of cellulitis and we had to put her on Venco for a few days of inpatient care. She was paying out of pocket and kept trying to leave AMA but we kept her for a few days to try and finish the treatment. When the infection was mostly cleared she was discharged and given abs prescriptions, appointments to attend a wound clinic to monitor the abscess, etc. Also we gave her strict instructions to change the bandages, monitor the wound, keep it clean, etc. If it gets worse call us, etc. She did none of those things. She never picked up to the antibiotics from the pharmacy. She skipped her wound clinic appointments 
and when we tried to contact her she had apparently dropped off the grid and was unreachable. We later found out this was because she went on vacation, several days after getting home, and after deciding to skip picking up the antibiotics, she decided to go on a two-week-long camping and river rafting trip with some friends. Let me repeat that, she had an open abscess on her foot that was recovering from infection. We told her to keep it dry and clean, and SHE went river rafting with IT.